Well, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Jacob Zimmerman uh, from the University of Toronto. We're very happy to have him. And this is our last talk, so it's a, it's a nice uh, end to the seminar for this year. And uh, he will be uh, speaking about uh, large compact sub-varieties of AG. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a big pleasure to be here, here in person and also online in the larger sense of here. So um, today I'm going to be um, talking about uh, joint work with uh, Sam Grushevsky, <clears throat> um, Salvatomandi, Salvatomani, Andello, and myself. <clears throat> and the basic idea behind what I want to talk about is the question of given X, a quasi-projective variety, how far is X from being compact? And we're going to go to some more concrete cases of well, one particular concrete case of this in a minute. But just to keep things uh, in the abstract, how do we measure whether a variety is compact or not? Well, one thing you can do is you can find a compactification, x bar of x, such that the dimension of the boundary you have to add is as small as possible. And you could sort of say, this is how close x is to being compact. <clears throat> Actually, I guess everyone can see. Yeah, I need to write it up. OK. Um, another thing you can do in kind of a similar but complementary style <clears throat> is you can look at y inside x, which is compact. And you could look at the maximal dimension of y. So again, if x is affine, it's not going to have any compact sub variety except for points. So you ask sort of how big a maximal dimensional thing it can have. And we call this, I'll call this maximal dimension sub c for compact of x. How big we can make this. <clears throat> and finally, <clears throat> you can imagine doing the same kind of thing here. Only you can imagine that X might have sort of one exceptional, very large dimensional compact subvariety, and otherwise it has none or only points or curves or something. So uh, instead, of what you can do actually, they can see everything, but you can't see. Okay, fantastic. Yes. Um, so, yes, let me just raise this up right now. Thank you for telling me. So, the third thing you can do is you can look at y in x compact and also insist that it passes through a general point of x. Or of course, I don't mean the generic point now, but really a general point over c, there's no trouble. If you're over like fp bar, you'd have to be a little careful what this means. Nonetheless, and then look at the maximal dimension of such a y. And I'll call this quantity m dim sub c gen of x. So there's some obvious relations. Obviously, this dimension is at most as big as this dimension. And there's a connection between the first two as well. <clears throat> because if I give you a compactification with a boundary whose dimension is not very large, I can keep cutting it down with sort of random hypersurfaces, cutting down the dimension. And so what you conclude is that the maximal dimension of a compact subvariety of x plus the co-dimension, the dimension of the boundary, <clears throat> is at least as big as dimension x minus 1, at least if I pick projective varieties so I can take random hyperservices by Bertini's theorem or something. 
So if I can get uh, compactifications with a small boundary, I can definitely make reasonably large compact subvarieties. But in general, it's quite hard, given a non-projective variety, to find compact subvarieties. Um, I understand. Yes, yes, this is all in the project, all in the algebraic category for now. Absolutely, absolutely. <clears throat> okay, so let me immediately specialize. We're going to be talking about AG, which is the moduli space of principally polarized abelian varieties of dimension G. And over the complex numbers, which is mainly the setting we'll be working with uh, anyways, this is isomorphic to the quotient of Ziegel space by the integer points. In general, you can't. Of course, in specific cases, you most definitely could. Um, but in general, this is tight, for sure. Mm -hmm. For example, take protective space, remove a hyperplane or yeah, a dimensional space, and you'll get this. <clears throat> so we'll be focusing on, on AG, which you can think of over the complex numbers in this way. If G equals 1, this is the usual parameterization of the modular curve. G is bigger than 1, that's some very similar thing. And um, in this case, we have, a, we have several compactifications of AG by the theory of Shimura varieties. I'm going to stick to the most basic one, which is the most useful one. So I'll just call AG bar, which is the Bailey Borel compactification, <clears throat> which is nice because it actually adds something of not that low dimension, but still reasonably low. The dimension of the boundary here is G g minus 1 over 2, whereas the dimension of AG itself is g, g plus 1 over 2. So it's a co-dimension G space, which, depending how you think about it, is reasonably large. G is a big number, so it's a pretty low piece you got to stick in. On the other hand, it's, it's very far from, from nothing. <clears throat> okay, so uh, what's known in, in AGC, and in this case, finding compact subvarieties of AG, is pretty much equivalent up to some nuances to finding sort of large families of abelian varieties, high dimensional families of abelian varieties of dimension G. <clears throat> so the best result in this direction was due to Kyo and Sadun. In 2003, they proved that the maximal dimension of a compact subvariety of AG is at most GG minus 1 choose 2 minus 1. <clears throat> and in fact, they proved something a little bit stronger. What they really proved, because their methods were sort of a mix between algebraic geometry and differential geometry, was that if I is at least 3 and X is in AG and the restriction of lambda i to x is zero, where lambda i is the ith churn class of the Hodge bundle in AG bar, <clears throat> then this implies that the dimension of x is at most i i minus one over two minus one, so i choose two minus one. <clears throat> And in fact, this result is slightly stronger than, well, it's quite a bit stronger than this one. It directly implies this one, because if you look at lambda g, which is the class on AG bar, and you restrict to the interior, you get zero. So if you have a compact subvariety inside AG, the restriction of lambda g to it is automatically zero. So this inequality implies this one. <clears throat> so yeah. The methods were kind of algebra geometric, but then to rule out certain examples, they had to use, at the time, sort of advanced methods in, in transcendence and differential geometry. Uh, 
The trickle is some cohomology class you can think of. Uh, like precisely? So you have a the, you have the Hodge bundle, um, and so the so it's just the ith trickle of that. Oh, okay. Sorry. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, it's it's hard to say intuitively. Sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, even for lambda, I mean, yeah, even lambda one, I'm not sure how to tell how to tell you. Besides, they can interpret a differential geometrically. I can give you certain like symmetric differential forms, so differential forms that are uh, invariant under SP2GR on Ziegel space, and it tells you some integral is equal to zero. But I'm not sure if that's the intuition you're sort of looking for, but it's something. Yeah, <clears throat> it's a good question. Um, okay, so one reason this is interesting is this is uh, false. So this is all over C, excuse me. This theorem is uh, entirely over C. It's false in characteristic P. <clears throat> so uh, it's false over FP. If you look at the uh, inside AG, there exists X in AG over FP, which is compact of dimension equal to G, G minus one over two. And this X you can basically think of as the super singular locus. And so Franz Zort and his collaborators wrote a lot about this stuff. They, they sort of noticed or observed this is false over FP. And uh, it was a big result to show this is that you have sort of large dimensional compact subvarieties of AG over FP. And it was a big result to show that over C, you at least sort of do one better. But of course, this is very far from answering the question, even though it's a huge advance, because the best lower bound is this, which gives you G minus one. If you just take random hypersurfaces and intersect them, you'll get something compact, which will be of dimension g minus 1. And the best upper bound is g choose 2 minus 1. So um, theorem I want to give due to the main thing we'll prove <clears throat> is we answer this question completely for AG. So first of all, if you ask for sort of the largest dimensional compact subvariety, which is general, it's not reliant on being in some specific piece of AG. No, this makes sense completely geometrically, 100%. Yeah. This is also, by the way, over C, fully over C. Or any characteristic zero field, of course. C is not special, but we're avoiding characteristic P. So this is just G minus one. You can't do better than cutting by random hypersurfaces. And if you care about the actual maximum, which is in some ways the more interesting notion, though they're both interesting depending on what you're doing, you get this really fun <clears throat> dichotomy where the answer is g minus 1 for g less than 16 and then g squared over 16 rounded down if g is at least 16 and even and g minus 1 squared over 16 rounded down if G is at least 16 or 17, I guess, and odd. <clears throat> so this case is basically copying this case because there's a copy of AG in AG plus one. But uh, it's sort of most impressive if I tell you nothing else about where it's coming from, because then it's like 16. When do things take over at 16? That's crazy. Um, but you have this, uh, this sort of disparity that's going on. So just to get a, a sense, there's this table that Sam draws, just to get a sense of what the numbers look like, which I'll draw here. So here's G, and I'll draw it for 3, 4, 5, 6, then we'll jump to 15, 16, 17, 18, and then to 100, just to see the asymptotics. So the max dimension 
of a compact subvariety. So here it starts out 2, 3, 4, 5 is g minus 1. Then around this region, it's 14 for 15, and then jumps to 16 here. And then it's 16 here, and then it's 20. So you start getting these quadratic jumps. And at 100, the value is 625 is the true value. And just to compare with the Kiel Sadun bound, there was known before. So 2, 5, 9, 14. Here it's 104, 119, 135, 152. And here it's 2, 4, 4, 9. So we get this sort of saving over what the best known bound very early. Um, and eventually it becomes about. Oh. I think the chat should just be able to raise their hand and speak. Is that or Jan, if you just if you just talk, we should be able to hear you. So, so, so I, 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 I have a question that concerning the explanation of this gap about about the sixteen, why sixteen or seventeen plays um, uh, the this Iola, the special Iola. Ah, yes, I'll, I'll explain that a bit later about why oh, sixteen oh. takes over, but that. The answer is that um, it doesn't really play a role. You get these dimensions for all G, they just take over once G is 16. So you have this family which looks unintimidating, but then kind of becomes very big. But, but I'll explain where that family comes from for sure. Oh, it's like finding large families of a billion varieties. Um, yeah, well, this is because AG is the moduli space of a billion varieties of dimension G. So finding fam like sub-varieties of AG naturally correspond to families of a billion varieties of dimension G. There's some subtlety because there's some stacky points, some orbifold points, but none of that's really relevant over here. You can add level, you can rigidify, the intuition is very solid in this case. Um, I think just because the way it's set up, if somebody has a question, please feel free to just interrupt me and start talking, you know. If it becomes chaos, we'll change it, but somehow I find that unlikely. So please feel free to just, uh, just speak up if you have a question. Thank you. <clears throat> um, okay. <clears throat> so... Before I get into some of the fineries of how we prove some of this stuff, <clears throat> um, let me talk about some corollaries very briefly for MG, which is another setting where one would love to know the answers to these questions, compact subvertice of MG, where we know much less and um, our work gives you something, but doesn't give you as much as we would hope. For MG. Something. It, it's not going to be everything, but we could so, sort of so little is known in the MG case that yes, we can, we can get a little somewhere with it. Um, so MG maps via the Torelli map, which are called J, to AG. But in fact, it maps to a slightly smaller space which I'm going to call AG in decomposable. The image of MG inside AG is not a closed subvariety. It's a closed subvariety. If you remove some stuff, where AG decomposable are basically those principally polarized billion varieties which split as a non-trivial product. Um, so it's, you know, A1 cross AG minus 1, union A2 cross AG minus 2, so forth. And then if you want to look at all of AG, it's more natural not to look at MG, but MG compact type. These are curves of compact type, so it's some compactification of MG. And these map really to AG now. So I'll still call this map J just by abusive notation. But know that this map, you can think of compact type curves like you take a bunch of lower genus curves, you glue them together into some kind of tree structure by identifying points. And then if your curves are hyperbolic, 
which points you sort of join at will affect the isomorphism class of the curve that you get. They aren't all isomorphic. So this map has very large fibers now. So not only is MG, the modelized space of curves, already quite small in AG, so it's quite hard to see anything about it. Uh, but if you, if you go to this bigger space, then you have to worry about the fact that this map is nowhere close to injective. It sort of removes a lot of stuff. Yes. MG naturally avoids this locus because, <laughs> well, but the Torelli theorem, basically. So no, no with the polarization. Yeah, yeah. So this is not saying you're isogenous to this, but the principal polarization also has to split. And the Torelli theorem works more generally for curves of, in some version, for curves of compact type. So if I, uh, if I have a curve whose Jacobian splits, the curve has to split as well. No, 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 no. This is isomorphism. I'm removing a closed subvariety here. Absolutely. Yes. Very different. <laughs> For sure. Um, OK. So now we can ask about what's known here. Well. <clears throat> So first of all, if you want to study MG, it's natural to ask about this indecomposable locus first and ask what are the maximal dimensional subvarieties, compact subvarieties in here. And we're removing something now from AG bar, not just the boundary, which is co-dimension G, but we're also removing this guy, which is uh, co-dimension G minus one. It's one dimension higher. And so what we can conclude as a corollary of our results is that the maximal dimension of a compact subvariety going through a generic point of the indecomposable locus is tantalizingly between g minus 2 and g minus 1. So it's tantalizing only because you're off by 1. And I don't actually know if we know what to expect here. We were pretty sure that the answer was g minus 2. I have become a little less sure. I don't know about my colleagues, but we don't know is the point. So that's kind of interesting. Now what's known about MG before our work? There's a theorem of Diaz, which by now has a lot of proofs, that gives you an upper bound on the maximal compact subvariety of, um, of MG. There's an upper bound of G minus 2, if G is at least 3. And there's a theorem again of Kiel and Sudan uh, in 03, in the same paper, which tells you that if you look at the maximal compact subvariety of the curves of compact type, that's bounded by 2G minus 4. <clears throat> so again, these guys have way more compact families because now you can vary the points along which you glue, and it's much easier to build compact families that way. This is CT, compact type. Yeah, these are compact type curves. I don't want to define them precisely, but they're basically, you have very mild uh, nodal singularities where you take curves, you just identify pairs of points together. Okay, so a corollary of our work is that, first of all, inside the modulized space of curves of compact type, we can actually identify the maximal dimension for G between 2 and 23. <clears throat> and if we instead ask about its image, inside of AG, we can get new upper bounds, which are still for not infinite G, for some pretty specific families of G, but better than what was known before. G over 2, floor squared, over 4, floor, for G at most 28. So I don't want to go through in detail how, how we get these 
just sort of point out we get these new bounds and there's nothing especially tricky about getting these um, once you have a result for AG, you basically, you know, keep track of the fibers of these guys, rule out the things you can, and import the results from AG in order to get these theorems. So that's basically all I wanted to say about MG, just point out that we get some consequences there for those who are interested. <clears throat> Jacob, what, what can you say about fiber? The, the fibers here are, um, so I'm like, of the four authors, I'm by far the least expert on, on MG, so take everything I say with a grain of salt. Um, but I believe these fibers are quite easy to understand. They're, they're just a matter of how you glue the curves together. Like if I take a genus two curve, a genus three curve, and I glue them together at a point, the Jacobian will just be the direct sum of the Jacobian of this guy and of this guy. Now, if I vary, that point around, well, I'm getting moduli because curves have hyperbolic curves have finite automorphisms. So I can actually keep track of two dimensions there, which point I'm gluing on each curve. In general, you have like tree structures where you're gluing more curves together, but that's pretty much how the how the fibers work. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right. <clears throat> so sorry, let's very briefly here. Ah, great. So let me say a little something about the proofs, how one would attack such a question. There's this great idea that I was lucky enough to have shared with me, which doesn't quite work by itself, but very much paints the picture of what's going on. So once again, let's consider AG and AG bar, the bailey borel compactification. And suppose we have an X in AG, which is some compact subvariety. The observation that we're going to use to attack it is that the boundary, which is quite high dimensional, actually deforms inside of AG, in this case, into the interior. No, 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 no. The estimate was a tool. The estimates are purely intrinsic to AG, of course. Mm -hmm. The argument also doesn't depend on the Bailey Borel. I'm just saying it here to clarify. We never use anything about any compactification. But yeah, the results are completely intrinsic. So the boundary de the deforms inside in the following way. We have this map A1 cross AG minus 1 maps via iota to AG. You can think of it as an injection. It's not quite an injection, but that's not important. Close enough. Uh, which just takes two abelian varieties and direct sums them to get a bigger one. <clears throat> And the boundary is essentially the copy of AG minus one you get at infinity by compactifying A1. If you take your elliptic curve and deform it up, then you get the boundary component. So um, what you can do is you can look at these one dimension smaller varieties where you fix iota, uh, where you fix the coordinate in A1. So you have a fixed elliptic curve across all G minus one dimensional abelian varieties. And the point is that this tends to infinity, deforms to the boundary. It actually deforms again exactly to a copy of the main boundary component, but that's not important for us. All we care about is it, is it leaves the space, the interior of the space, as your curve E goes to infinity in the moduli space of elliptic curves. So as a corollary, since we started with an X, with, with an X which is compact for sort of large enough E, degenerate enough E, it can't intersect this guy because X is compact in the interior. So therefore there exists some open set of E's in A1 such that X intersect iota of E 
cross AG minus 1 is empty. So it's easy to see there exists such an open set in the usual Euclidean topology, but of course this is all algebraic, these are algebraic conditions, and so there must exist a Zariski open set where this is true. So X must only intersect these guys for finitely many E's if they do. Which means, I remember you can't see this board, so let me switch. Which means what? Well, now let's assume, because we know how to make G minus one dimensional guys, and our theorem says that's the best. Let's assume the dimension of X is G. Then inside of AG, X and all of these fibers have complementary dimensions, so you would expect them to intersect. Which means if they ever intersected transversely, by which I mean something very weak, I just mean intersected in a dimension zero point, then for nearby E's they would also intersect, which can't happen. Which means X intersect all of these guys, when it does happen, is never transverse. Even if they do intersect, it must be at least in the curve. It can't be in a point. Okay, so those are nice observations. Um, unfortunately, by themselves, they still don't do all that much because this is just one subvariety inside AG. Okay, you can avoid it. It's, not, it's hard to reason about what happens when you avoid it. However, you can do a little better. The idea, or one idea, is to use Hecke operators to go from considering one such variety to considering many. So very briefly, how do Hecke operators work? I'll give a very brief summary of what I mean by them. So if I have an element H in GSP, over Q, you can think of SP, GSP gives you a few more, but it doesn't matter. This is a general symplectic group. It gives me a map from Siegel space to itself. In fact, a complex automorphism, because GSP2GR is a complex automorphism group of this, mod scalars. And this descends to a finite correspondence which I'll call TH from AG, and I'll draw this like squiggly arrow, note it's only a correspondence, it's a multi-valid function from AG to AG. <clears throat> and so now we can apply this Hecke operator to everything. We can apply it to that big variety, A1 cross AG minus one. We can apply it to those fibers, E cross AG minus one, and all the reasoning holds we still have sort of a family of varieties which deform to the boundary. So our X better not intersect them for the risky open set of fibers. And when it does, it better not be transverse. So as a conclusion, we get that X intersect TH of iota of E cross AG minus one for any E and any H is never transverse where again, I'm using this very, very weakly, I mean that there's no zero dimensional component in this intersection ever. Okay. Oops, I'm doing this poorly. Sorry, there we go. Okay, so that's better, but it's still not enough because now you have countably many of these varieties. There's a lot of them. They're sort of easy to show that they're dense in almost every possible sense of the word. They're dense, they're dense in some jet spaces, they do a whole bunch of stuff, but so what? You can still avoid all of them, and the examples we'll eventually make, which realize these numbers, will avoid all of them. So what's the idea? <clears throat> well, the idea now, which before I give the idea, Let's give the enemies. 
there's sort of by and large two enemies to deal with. One is there's no intersections at all. And two is there are intersections, but the intersections are all dimension bigger than zero of x with these kind of guys, with all these varieties. Correct. So I'm saying that the enemy, like we win if it's a transverse intersection. And so what are we avoiding? Well, if there's no intersections, we can't get started. And if there are only transverse intersections, then we're also in trouble. So we can deal with both these at once, but in particularly, we can deal with no intersections by thickening the family we're considering even further. To do that, we have to leave the realm of algebraic geometry ever so briefly. So instead of reasoning in AG, we consider the uniformization map from Ziegel space to AG. And inside here, we have H1 cross AG minus one, which is the universal cover of that A1 cross AG minus one. And this really is an injection now. And inside here, we can just fix a point. I'm going to fix I cross HG minus 1. Now let's look at X tilde just to be the inverse image of X. Now X tilde is some horrible thing, but it's still complex analytic. We're sort of very, very much left realm of algebra, but we still got a complex analytic variety. <clears throat> and now what we can do is we can consider g dot i cross h g minus one. Sorry, let me call this h. H applied to i cross h g minus one intersect x tilde. Let's consider these guys. We're now h is going to be constrained to gg gsp2gr instead of gsp2gq because we've left the realm of algebra we can consider all of these guys analytically complex analytically they all look the same they're all just copies of h1 cross hg minus 1 it's just if h is not a rational does not have rational coefficients you're not going to play well with uh, the descent down to ag but analytically, they all sort of look the same. <clears throat> I'll leave that up for a little bit longer. <clears throat> the idea is the following. Suppose there exists some H a real H such that uh, that intersection is transverse. Meaning that it has a zero dimensional component. <clears throat> well, being transverse is an open condition in the Euclidean topology because you have two complex analytic varieties of complementary dimension. If they're transverse at a point, and I wiggle things a bit, they'll still be transverse. So this is open. This condition is open in GSP2GR. So therefore, can find nearby H prime inside GSP2GQ, which still has this property. And now we win, because if you look at H prime dot this, and we look at the image down to uh, AG, it will be algebraic. It will, in fact, be one of these guys here, and we can run the argument through. So as long as our x is such that, if we look at x tilde in Ziegel space, we can find some real H, such that this translate intersects X tilde transversely, then we're happy. 
Okay, so this still isn't always the case. So what allows us to proceed now is a tool that I seem to use over and over again. Now we're going to use some functional transcendence. Okay, so what's our setup? We have this map from HG to AG. We're going to say that W in AG is bi algebraic if W is algebraic and its inverse image is as close to being algebraic as you could have, meaning if I take its inverse image in HG, I take a connected component. So this is algebraic if W algebraic and takes the inverse image, takes the component, then this is open in an algebraic variety of whatever, C to the, like, uh, Ziegel space is naturally inside the symmetric space of C to the G. Two by two matrices. If you're open in an algebraic variety here, then you're bi-algebraic. <clears throat> and you can actually classify all these guys So the theorem of Umo and Yafayev that by algebraic is a condition that can be interpreted in Shimura language as what's known as weakly special. I'll tell you how to think about it in a second, <clears throat> but uh, what does this mean? More or less, weakly special means that you can think about it in terms of Hodge loci. So it's some Hodge locus in AG. If you think of AG as a variation of billion varieties, you can pick some tensors. You can ask for them to be Hodge. The locus where they're Hodge is going to give you some, whoop, excuse me, weakly special thing. Um, <clears throat> they're group orbits in an appropriate sense. Or oh, their image in, inverse image in Ziegel space is some kind of group orbit that's well understood. And some examples are like, you can think of AK cross AG minus K. You can think of imposing some endomorphism structure, so like abelian varieties of PEL type, where you insist they all have some action by some algebra or something like that. You restrict the polarization. And there's lots of these guys. There's a whole literature, a lot to say about them. Um, I'm going to leave it there, except I'll just give you an analogy for how to think about them. If you think of AG as analogous to an abelian variety, so the, not a point, but I'm saying, suppose, think of the variety AG and compare it to an abelian variety, then these weakly specials, you should think of as being analogous to cosets of abelian subvarieties. And if you were to think of special varieties, which is also a notion, they would be torsion cosets of abelian subvarieties. These come up all the time in like arithmetic geometry, arithmetic questions, um, but I'll, I'll sort of leave it here. <clears throat> and a definition is that a point X in AG is Hodge generic if it avoids all of these kind of exceptional guys, if it's not contained in a proper weekly special. So basically, there's some countable union of subvarieties which behave in some exceptional ways. 
you can say a point hard generic if it avoids all that stuff. And in fact, being hard generic is generic. Uh, it's a full measure set. It's a very general property. OK, so we're going to use a theorem. Actually, no, sorry. Let me go up here. We've classified the, or Umo and Yafe have classified the weekly special guys. Now we're going to use a theorem, which is due to Mock, Tila, and myself, but it's part of a long program. This is sort of an Axe Shanuel theorem based on Shanuel's conjecture and work of Axe that proved it in some functional case, um, which has the following if you have something in AG, and something in Ziegel space, which are algebraic, meaning this one is actually algebraic, and this one is as close to algebraic as you can get. So it's some algebraic thing intersect Ziegel space. And if the dimension of their intersection, once I pull back y to hg, is bigger than you would expect, this is what you would expect. But if it's unlikely, so it's bigger, there must be some weakly special thing going on. Then the intersection is contained inside some weakly special subvariety. All of which is to say that if we go back to, to our uh, strategy over here, well, we want to avoid these intersections being positive dimensional. The only obstruction to them being positive dimensional are these weakly special varieties showing up. So if X contains a point which is not contained in any weakly special variety, namely a Hodge generic point, then the game is over. We can't do better than g minus 1 by this argument, and everything's done. And that's how you prove uh, the theorem about you know, max dim c gen, is, is this argument. I have a few minutes left, so I want to say, to say where this comes from. You, you then, of course, to, to figure out what's going on, you have to understand what's happening uh, if there are weakly special things going on. <clears throat> if you have these sort of Hodge Losa interfering. So in fact, if you take this argument and you push it forward, what you can prove is not just uh, a bound on how big compact subvarieties are, you can essentially classify the maximal compact subvarieties of AG. What they look like, sorry, I keep losing pages. So compact subvarieties. Of AG, these are the maximal ones. What they look like is the following. <clears throat> they all look like up to isogeny x1, let me say xc cross x non c sitting inside AG1 cross AG2 where g1 plus g2 is equal to g, where x non c in a g2 has dimension g2 minus 1. So it's just the, the guy we're talking about before. And xc in a g1 is a compact Shimura subvariety or special subvariety. So this Shimura, these special subvarieties, this Hodge loci are the only place where atypical compact subvarieties uh, come from. And so you first prove this theorem. And so you, you go down the analysis further, you do some more stuff. Uh, you prove this classification. And then to get the actual numbers, you've got to sort of roll up your sleeves and classify 
compact Shimura varieties, or at least their dimensions, see how big they can be. And it turns out the biggest one is this g squared over 16. So I can describe quickly, and then I'll finish. Um, what this looks like, it's, it's very explicit to make, to make these guys. Uh, a simple way to do it is you take an E over Q, some imaginary quadratic field. You look at SU uh, over E of uh, uh, 2GF, where F is some Hermitian form, which has signature G, G, so it's as split as possible in one embedding, and it's compact, so 2 G, 0 in another. You need this compactness at a real place to ensure the Shimura variety is compact. And then this group, SU, 2 G, F, acts on E to the 2 G, is isomorphic to Q to the 4G. It gives you an embedding in the symplectic space. You compute all the relevant dimensions, and you get this quantity over here. So this unique construction and guys of the same type are what account for these exceptions. There's other compact Shimura subvarieties which do better than G minus 1. Um, we, can't, we don't give a full classification because it's hard. It's essentially analogous to classifying Lie groups. Um, but if you just want to pick out the maximal ones, uh, that, that's achievable. All right, I'll stop here. Thank you very much for your attention.